Recall then that our channels and pores are not saturable, and that differs from the other class of passive transporters that we want to look at, which are called facilitated diffusion transporters, though um, in some cases the lingo changes and we call these carriers. So carriers is another term often used to describe the facilitated diffusion transporters that can become saturable and that are distinguished from the um, channels and pores that we for, refer to as non-saturable. So in this case, we know that um, there's no energy required, right? Anytime we use that term passive, whether we're describing simple passive diffusion where the small molecular weight hydrophobic molecules can uh, move directly across the membrane, whether we're talking about carriers or whether we're talking about channels and pores, we know that there is no energy input in required. And in saying that, we also recognize that the molecules can move only from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. So that's what, exactly what we're seeing taking place here, where we see, in this case, a carrier that is saturable. It can accommodate only one of these triangular molecules at a time, analogous to the ship passing through the lock. There are big conformational changes that have to take place every time this molecule passes through this transport. Um, think of it this way. The transporter binds very specifically to its one substrate. Uh, we could use our enzyme pickup line again here because there's a, a particular substrate or class of substrates that it uniquely recognizes. There's all of these conformational changes. It's like a domino effect. So once the triangular substrate interacts with a few amino acids, that triggers an effect that is just like this um, dominoing throughout the molecule. So it's like if the substrate binds up top, it triggers this effect that kind of changes the conformation throughout. It's like this domino shaking and moving that allows that molecule to move through the, the um, central cavity of the carrier. So um, the solute binds specifically to the transporter triggering a conformational change. And so the transporter changes conformations to allow passage. And of course, then the solute can be moved into the region that in which it has been lower in concentration. We also recognize that if for some reason it became lower in uh, higher in con con concentration inside of the cell than it was outside of the cell, it would swoosh right back out because we know that these, these are allowing uh, transport down the concentration gradient. In the previous slide, we showed uni a uniport where there was only one solute passing through the transport of the carrier at once. But oftentimes we see situations where more than one solute will move through the transporter. Either they'll move concomitantly, that is two of them together will move into the cell or out of the cell. And we call that, as many of you will remember, a, a symport. So if two molecules here, in this case, the square molecule and the round molecule move into the cell together, then we would recognize this as being a symport. We could also see a symport where maybe they're moving in the opposite direction together uh, out of the cytosol and maybe into the extracellular space or into the periplasm, depending on what kind of cell we're talking about here. We can also see co-transport in the opposite direction, an antiport, where we see this in this case, the square molecule moving in while the round molecule is moving out. We recognize this as an antiport. Now, recognize that this terminology, this link can be utilized to describe more than one type of transport. We could see this potentially describing active transport as well, but these terms are important terms to introduce right now. I know that many of you have been really missing the michaelis metten equation. I know that I have, so not to worry because as it turns out, the kinetics of transport are analogous for, for a facilitated diffusion transporter. They're analogous to the kinetics that we see for enzymes. So we're gonna be able to pull out an analogous equation to describe the kinetics for transport and recognize that 
much of this equation is very much the same as it was for an enzyme because clearly we have that one substrate uh, or group of unique substrates to which the transporter binds and recognizes and that undergoes a conformational change where the action in this case is not um, a catalysis per se of a reaction but instead a an enhancement of transport so we still see the the overarching action of that transporter on a solute molecule on a substrate so we can look at the equation in sort of the same light um, and recognize that the initial velocity is equal to the maximal velocity times the substrate concentration do you notice that we actually qualify this by saying that we're always looking at the substrate concentration outside side of the cell, that's essential because we know that that's, um, we have to think about what particular solute concentration matters in terms of transport. So if we've got a transporter that's transporting things into a cell, then it's going to be the substrate concentration outside of the cell that is going to be pertinent. So that's uh, how we'll slightly modify the equation in this case. But the other thing that's true is remember that Km plus substrate concentration was what we found in the denominator in the michaelis metten um, equation, but we have to recognize that that Km was unique to enzymes, and so for the transporters, we're going to put in a new constant there called the KTR, the K transport. But once again, this constant describes the same thing. So it refers to the um, concentration of substrate that allows half maximal transport rate. So once again, we could draw our ever um, trusted function for the equation and go ahead and show that we have again initial velocity on the y-axis and substrate concentration on the x-axis and of course when we talk about the substrate concentration in this case we're focusing on that outside of the cell so I'll say substrate out that's a little hard to read but that's what that says um, concentration of substrate outside of the cell, uh, initial velocity as a function of that substrate concentration, and our ever-trusted hyperbolic rectangular hyperbola that we can draw uh, describing the overarching relationship between initial velocity and substrate concentration. Of course, the function approaching maximal velocity, or Vmax, so we'll label that as well on our graph. And we'll remember that Km was the substrate concentration that allowed for half maximal velocity. So in the same way, KTR for transport is that special substrate concentration that allows for half maximal velocity of transport. So right there, that would be our K transport. If we can jot that down. So this function, recognizing the similarities there with only small differences um, with respect to what we're labeling, and we could talk about a few other things on the curve as well. So for example, if we had, say, another transporter that transported the same solute molecule, but maybe it had a higher affinity for that substrate, we could draw another curve, um, and maybe we'll just draw this one in green. Let's do black. We'll draw this one in black where we would recognize that if it had a higher affinity for substrate, it would have a, a lower K transport. So it would hit half maximal at a lower substrate concentration. And actually, I'm going to restate that just because I know sometimes there's been, there has been some confusion regarding that. So the lower the con substrate concentration is at half maximal, so see here we see this function reaching its half maximal velocity at a lower substrate concentration, the lower the KTR, the greater the affinity the enzyme or in this case the transporter for its substrate. So we can recognize that there. Um, and we'll jot that down just momentarily.
However, before we do do that and we leave our graph behind, let's make a quick contrast with pores and channels because remember pores and channels were not saturable. So we would recognize them as being a linear function um, where basically the, the velocity depended just linearly on substrate concentration. So th that's not a very good line, but um, as substrate increases, the velocity increases and we don't reach that point of saturation. So it's easy for us to recognize then in the um, in the role of these passive diffusion transporters that we see that we do indeed see a point of saturation and that's really what's occurring right here as we see the functions ap approaching maximal velocity is that this is where we're achieving saturation of the transporter so no matter how hard the transporters are working, if there's a high enough substrate concentration outside of the cell, they're going to get backlogged, right? It's just like the lock and the ship analogy, where if there are enough ships waiting to go through that lock, there's going to be a backlog, there's going to be a traffic jam, there's going to be ships waiting for transport. And the same thing is true here. Um, and once that point of saturation is reached, there's we're hitting a maximal uh, we're approaching a maximal rate for transport, and so we're going to see a backlog of substrate concentrations at some point, no matter how high the substrate concentration is outside of the cell, there will be no more room for increased velocity of transport, right, when we hit that point of saturation. Okay, great, let's write that down. Um, just make sure we have everything in our notes. So the K transport, um, the greater the affinity for the substrate, the lower that value is, and we saw that by comparison. It's the same idea as Km, right, with the lower the Km, the greater the affinity of the enzyme for substrate. Note that the transporter is saturable, and we saw that in the figure that we were just looking at, also figure 9.35 in your book. The rate of transport increases until it can't increase anymore, um, and we can also note that the rate of transport um, really does depend upon a concentration differential. So if there's, if, in this situation we've been talking about lots of substrate out and a concentration gradient existing, but this these kinetics really are only pertinent if there is a gradient. If the concentration of substrate both in and out of the cell then is equal, then these kinetics are no longer applicable because obviously there won't be any transport through these passive transporters if we have an equal concentration of substrate both in and out. So it does require that concentration gradient in order to describe the kinetics um, this way as we, we have done. Our next topic of active transporters of course needs little introduction because we know that active unlike passive transporters require energy. There has to be some type of energy input and of course your first thought as to what that energy could be is ATP, right? And that is one possibility. Those transporters that utilize ATP as an energy source, we term primary active transport. That means that there's a direct source of energy. ATP is one of those possible sources, so is light, and so is the ETC, or electron transport. There are some fascinating kinds of primary active transporters, though the one that gets the most attention is the active transport that requires ATP as an energy source. We call it ABC transporters. Typically, you don't see it called by its full name, which is um, ATP binding cassette. I'm actually going to bring a, a quick picture of an ABC transporter. This is something that you may have talked about in many of your other classes. We're just recognizing that it does, in fact, require the hydrolysis of ATP in a cytosolic domain, where then that powers the influx of some solute. A lot of times this is like a sugar or an amino acid. Um, this is common in E. coli. It's also common in our body. So it's a cross-domain uh, cross phenomenon. So we see a solute binding protein that is bound to the solute, then its influx being powered by the hydrolysis of ATP. Now, there's a very fam famous type of ABC transporter called P-glycoprotein. And this is where... Um, I. I believe that many of you who are interested in medicine were, are going to get super jazzed. Mason, I thought specifically of you because a lot of times what happens, P-glycoprotein um, actually is an ABC transporter that can sometimes be inverted. That is, um, we know that it typically is supposed to be transporting things in, but it actually has become modified in some cases, enabling uh, cancerous cells to transport drugs out.
And this also will interest Bailey because sometimes um, these P glycoprotein ABC transporters can get modified to transport um, uh, steroid drugs out. Okay, so from a medical point of view, we know that that means that this would be like uh, inflammatory diseases, diseases that have a, like a high incident of inflammation. You would use an anti-inflammatory steroid to treat them, but these are also the same as the anabolic steroids that weightlifters will use. So it's interesting that P glycoprotein can sometimes be turned on its head and instead of transporting things in, it pumps drugs out. So whether that be a um, uh, an anabolic steroid that it might pump out and so therefore not be affected by, so this would inf affect um, drug treatment of inflammatory diseases, sometimes affects uh, drug treatment of cancers, that these, these uh, will actually uh, transport the... Um, readily transport the drug out. So hey, if we bring back in that picture, recognize then that rather than transporting this solute, say sugar or amino acid in, what will happen is these ABC transporters will develop the ability to uh, transport a drug out. And that is really a crazy thing that causes multi-drug resistance. It's, it's also something that happens in E. coli. So if you're trying to use some drug to treat the E. coli infection, the ABC transporter will learn how to transport the drug out, leading to multi-drug resistance. So multi-drug resistance, resistance in the treatment of cancer, multi-drug resistance in the treatment of bacterial infection, multi-drug resistance in the treatment of, of infl inflammatory diseases. Wow, mind-blowing, right? This is called the sodium potassium ATPase. And as it sounds, this is actually going to be transporting sodium and potassium, but both of those ions in this ATPase are going to be transported against their concentration gradient. This will enable a gradient then to form of sodium higher in concentration outside of the cell and potassium higher in concentration inside of the cell. So let's take a moment to write that down. So we recognize that the sodium gradient is high outside, low inside, and potassium is high inside, low outside. Notice the differences there in concentration. 5 millimolar potassium outside of the cell, 140 millimolar inside. Um, almost the swap of that for the sodium gradient, 5 to 15 millimolar inside, 145 millimolar outside. So a sodium potassium ATPase is, has hard work to do when it attempts to transport a sodium ion out of the cell. And that's in fact what it is going to do, push a sodium ion out, push a potassium ion in, and result in the uphill transport of both of those. Now notice that this requires energy. Going against a gradient that is that steep is going to require ATP input. Now it's it's worth noting that um, this is one of the things that gives away the importance of this is just simply to look at the amount of ATP that is used to power a sodium potassium ATPase. So more than a third of the ATP consumed in a resting animal is used to pump sodium and potassium ions. Wow, that's a lot of the ATP needed for just powering this transport. Better mean that, and does mean, that these ions are very, very important then. Um, sodium, of course, very important in osmotic regulation. And potassium, as we talked about before, a lot of signaling importance, important roles for potassium, um, such as nerve signaling. So when we look at the sodium-potassium ATPase, um, we also can note that um, it leads to what we might say an overall gradient across the cell. So it contributes, if you will, to membrane potential. So what we see is that with three sodium ions, pumped out of the cell and two potassium ions in, what is that going to cause in terms of net charge across the cell membrane? Three cations out, two cations in. Yeah, you betcha. That's going to lead to an overall net negative charge inside of the cell. So this is contributing to the overall um, membrane potential.
Now, I also have a really cool cartoon. Um, this is something that I think Matt is going to appreciate that's actually showing a kind of cool depiction. And I can't actually really cite an author on this because there wasn't one given, but you'll recognize at least the Tumblr site that is provided here. Three sodium, three sodium ions taken out extracellular for every two potassium ions brought in and an ATP has to be hydrolyzed to power that. Sweet. A lot of you fitness nerds are totally gonna dork out and recognize what I have here today. Um, this is an old box for emergency, and while maybe your box is newer, uh, I thought this one was a fun example to bring in today. And on the back of this box, we actually have a picture of the sodium potassium ATPase. So I'm going to try to show you this sort of up close and personal, um, but you can see there that they've got this image of the sodium potassium ATPase. And then they've got sort of this, you know, little bit of commercial plug for how this um, sodium potassium ATPase is activated by the emergency emergency effervescence. So let's actually read through this um, just a little bit. The single cell is the unit of life and each of our bodies is composed of some 70 trillion of these tiny factories, of course outweighed by the uh, microbial uh, tiny factories in our body. Um, side note, um, side note soapbox. Um, so if we can take care of them, they will take care of us. Yet the major mineral activator within the cells is potassium, present in healthy cells at levels 20 times those of sodium. So when you add water to the emergency powder, it immediately effervesces to a powerful, delicious, and healthful activator of your metabolic functions with the astounding benefit of a thousand milligrams of mineral ascorbates plus the B vitamins. So they're really claiming to um, to affect your sodium potassium ATPase with the, with the potassium that they're providing in this um, nutrient supplement, so to speak. But it's, it's kind of cool that they've related it to the sodium potassium ATPase. Um, there's some other fun, sort of fun things on this. Um, um, we are not made up, as one would have supposed, of successively enriched packets of our own parts. We are shared, rented, occupied. Without the mitochondria, we would not move a muscle, drum a finger, or think a thought. This is a quote by Dr. Lewis Thomas. So it's kind of interesting um, to uh, recognize the you know pop culture tapping into this idea of mitochondria as a powerhouse. As soon we'll be studying metabolism and we'll look more intimately at some of those functions. And then here on the bottom, vitamin C is essential for the formation and maintenance of connective tissue is a powerful antioxidant and is involved in normal immune function. So remember studying vitamin C um, and its important role in the enzymes that create hydroxyproline and hydroxy hydroxylysine, those very important constituents of collagen. And then on the side, if you look at the ingredients of this, of course there's a lot of the vitamins that we've talked about in our cofactor cha chapter, um, but it's also interesting to note that you can buy a special flavor um, of this, a tangerine that they actually advertise on here and it's tangerine plus glucosamine. Um, so you can think back to the sugar derivatives, the amino derivatives of sugars that we discussed in the carbohydrate chapters and the very important role of glucosamine in um, connective tissue formation. So just kind of interesting to see how the interfaces between pop culture, um, that is commercialism and consumerism within our emergency um, relate very much to our scientific coverage and how here they're tapping into that science to help explain the function of emergency as a dietary supplement. So, pretty cool. The glycoprotein and the sodium potassium ATPase are both good examples of primary active transport. Let's look now at the second type, secondary active transport, in which the source of energy, instead of being ATP directly or light, instead of being those things, it is going to be the gradients that had to have been generated by some sort of primary active transport. So driven by an ion concentration gradient. And we could look at this in terms of being something ranging from, say, the sodium gradient that we saw forming because of the sodium potassium ATPase, or it could also be something like the proton motive force, which we know is formed when we rip and strip high energy electrons off of a fuel source, and that fuel source is, is oxidized, generating these, these 
electrons that are high in energy pass through the electron transport chain and are used to generate a proton gradient. Now that's going to come up more later, but the ion gradient could be of either of those two types. It could be a proton motive force or it could be some other ion that is in higher concentration on one side of the membrane or another. Let's look at an example in E. coli to start with. The lactose permease of E. coli is actually powered by the electrochemical gradient of the proton motive force. So as E. coli cells um, chow down on their dinner, they're taking high energy electrons from the food source and using those electrons to pump protons across the cellular membrane. So generated across the cellular membrane of an E. coli cell is a proton motive force. So we recognize then that we would have a higher concentration of protons outside of the E. coli cell than inside. And of course, that's our, that's our proton motive force. So I'm just drawing out here a high hydrogen ion concentration external to the cell. Of course, remembering the action of all of the members of the electron transport chain that have served to transport uh, protons out of the cell, creating this gradient that's like a pent-up battery-like force. Um, it really is power that can be tapped into, in this case, to power transport. We recognize that on the flip side, lactose is the molecule that needs to be transported against its concentration gradient. So we would recognize then that there's a lot of lactose present inside of the E. coli cell, and um, in fact present at a, a much higher concentration inside of the cell than it is outside of the cell. So I'm going to leave it to you guys to draw a, a bunch more molecules of lactose, that disaccharide, inside of the E. coli cell, recognizing that um, that means that transport of the lactose is going to be very much uphill, up its concentration gradient, so energy is very much required. And that energy is going to come from the proton motive force. It's actually almost like, it's almost going to be like the way that a river da runs downhill. The proton motive force will run downhill as well. And the lactose will catch a ride on that proton motive force. And I know a lot of you said that finding or, or that aquatic animals were your favorite and that you would want to be an aquatic animal. And so I hope many of you have seen Finding Nemo and you're watched the part where um, the Nemo meets up with the turtles and the turtles are all like ride in the EAC, dude. Uh, and so this is what I think of whenever I think of the proton motive force is that our lactose molecule is going to hook up with the proton motive motive force and it's going to be right in the PMF to get into the cell. So it's a downhill um, gradient movement for the protons and that powers the uphill movement of the lactose. So let's watch that happen as we see first that the hydrogen ion that will power this transport binds initially to the transporter and this actually triggers a conformational change within the transporter. At that point then the um, the transporter is more amenable to the full, complete transport of the lactose molecule and down swishes the proton with its gradient, powering the influx of the lactose. So let's, let's watch it happen. Pretty sweet. Um, and then we can say, hey, this is a symport, right? This is definitely the co-transport, the concomitant transport of two molecules in the same direction. So the lactose permease, an excellent example of a secondary active transporter where the proton motive force is powering the influx of the lactose. The proton motive force is certainly not the only type of gradient that can power inward transport and in fact when we're talking about animal cells it's more likely that we'll see different sorts of ion gradients powering that influx because just simply of the location of the gradients and that, that'll become clearer as we study more and more uh, metabolism but transport of glucose in intestinal cells in animals is driven by the sodium ion gradient and remember talking about how that sodium ion gradient is established uh, over on the left I've just briefly reviewed that drawing in for our review 
the sodium potassium ATPase and recognizing that the sodium gradient is established uh, with the use of that ATPase. So remember the influx of potassium and the efflux of sodium leading to the overarching high concentration of sodium external to the cell. So then again, just like the hydrogen ions in our previous example formed a river of opportunity for inward transport, now the sodium ions form that, that pent up energy source. And so if we have a molecule such as glucose, um, and that glucose is in very uh, high concentration inside of the cell, and in very low concentration outside of the cell, so we want to be able to power its, its influx against its gradient. So you may want to jot in your notes that there's a very high glucose concentration inside of the cell, that transport has got to be uphill against the gradient. And what a perfect ion to power that, the sodium cation, because we know it's in such high concentration outside of the cell, creating this pent-up energy for the glucose to ride on the sodium gradient and get on in. So the um, concaminate influx of the sodium cation driving the influx of the glucose. So another symporter, another example of secondary active transport, but this time the sodium gradient is what's being used rather than the proton motive force.